Hello, everyone. Uh, at first, let me thank you for coming to my presentation talk. My name is uh, Jerzy Vinopal, and I work as a checkpoint research. Uh, I was, work as a researcher for checkpoint research, and among my specializations are reverse engineering, malware research, and dissection of advanced threats. This talk is about breaking boundaries, so more specifically, investigating vulnerable drivers and mitigating risks. So let's jump to it. First things first, let's start with some brief intro uh, about vulnerable drivers. So uh, this subject is around for a while, uh, but it gained more attention in recent years. Uh, one of the possible reasons could be Microsoft's effort to still keep evolving, you know, improving the Windows security, especially regarding the protection of kernel. Uh, this is also the reason why it becomes really harder to cross the boundary from user mode to kernel mode. And you know, the attacker's perspective is uh, basically that gaining the kernel privileges points to owning the system. So their pr prioritized approach become the driver exploitation. And uh, when it comes to driver exploitation, uh, it serves to reach certain capabilities that are normally not available from the user mode, like uh, rootkits, mini filters, EDI killers, an elevation of privileges, or bypass, uh, digital, uh, digital signature enforcement bypass, which means like loading unsigned drivers. Uh, there is a project called Low Drivers which has significantly increased the popularity of vulnerable drivers, because this project contains like, a lot of known-to-be-vulnerable drivers. Despite the fact that this project is strictly focused on defensive measures, it also opens the space for you know, such a huge existence, a huge database, uh, also opens the space uh, for attackers and for offensive operations. It's like uh, there is nothing easier for attackers than you know, wait for the latest contribution to this project, or wait for the latest added new known vulnerable driver, and abuse it sooner than some protection are applied. So once we have such a project, uh, which is like a publicly available space accumulating uh, known to be vulnerable drivers, uh, it can actually raise some questions. Like, uh, why are there so many vulnerable drivers and what might be causing them to be vulnerable? Why some drivers are prone to crossing security boundaries? And do they have something in common? Can we use it uh, for or address it for mitigation and remediation? These are actually questions I will do my best to answer during this talk. Uh, a lot of research has been already conducted regarding vulnerable drivers, like uh, majority of them uh, serve mainly for some educational purposes, like one-on-one -on -one steps for reverse engineering Windows drivers, or creation of proof of concept for you know, some exploitation of drivers. Those that stand out were uh, doing or performing or showing some unique approach for mass hunting for of vulnerable drivers, uh, but uh, mostly they focused on some uh, logical bugs related to uh, physical memory mapping. So the impact was like uh, reading kernel address, reading kernel memory, writing to kernel memory, which is super cool. But they usually hit the critical moment during the manual verification. Like they got like thousands of drivers that are using the physical memory mapping. But during the manual verification, they found out that it's not a security boundary, like that you need an administrator to start the communication with the driver. So, you know, it's, it's not actually a vulnerability. So what makes the driver vulnerable? Surprise, surprise, it's not the bug itself, it's actually the crossing of security boundary. So here is a very brief table uh, where we have the initial, privileges, the elevated privileges, and if it is considered to be crossing security boundary. So it is obvious that if we have non-privileged user and it is elevated to system, of course, this is crossing security boundary. If we have non-privileged user and we are elevating to admin, it's crossing security boundary. But if we have admin and when we are elevating to system, that is something what is not considered to be crossing security boundary. And there it, it starts to be even more confusing when it comes to service to admin, not 
security boundary, but service to system, yes, no, it depends. And there are even some rare cases where even an admin to system can be considered to be uh, a crossing security boundary. Like, uh, usually when, we, when it is uh, about uh, Windows built-in drivers, which is abused by threat actors, APTs, and uh, you know, it, the driver is reported, uh, still, despite the fact it's the elevation from admin to system, Microsoft can decide to patch the vulnerability, assign a CVE, so it still could be considered as a crossing security boundary. So it's, it's really confusing, but for us, uh, it's, we are kind of interested in straightforward boundary non-privileged user to system, which is the one we should target and cross. So the key idea about this talk, about the research behind this talk is, Let's mass hunt for non-privileged user accessible drivers. So the first thing that actually matters is the discretionary access control list, which is a part of SDDL that is applied on the driver's device. Uh, that's, the, that's the access list that literally say who can access the driver. Uh, when it is, when we are talking about, you know, uh, when we are trying to find something what vulnerable drivers have in common or can have in common, there is no better place than low drivers database. So just with mass processing of the low drivers database, uh, we focused on the group, uh, which is known as like known to be vulnerable driver group. And we used a simple Yara rule to filter out 64-bit sun drivers. You can see the Yara rule here. It's just uh, detecting the PE, detecting 64-bit 64 uh, 64 Windows drivers, and checks if the driver uh, is uh, signed. It's not a real verification, it's just uh, uh, that the signature is present in the binary and the hash is matching. Yeah, it's not the real verification against the CRL certificate revocation list. Uh, but still, we got kind of start, good starting point that we had like 224 known to be vulnerable 64-bit signed drivers that are part of the Low Drivers project. We found out that 90% of them are accessible from non-privileged user, so they are prone to crossing the security boundary from non-privileged users to system. And it can be considered as a design flaw if you can combine the non-restricted accessibility with some capabilities that can be abused to commit privilege operation. This is actually what makes the driver vulnerable. Uh, there is other questions like, what makes the driver accessible by non-privileged users? Uh, you know, when we went over all of that 924 drivers, we quickly noticed some similarities that uh, were repeatedly, uh, repeatedly occurred in the code uh, and make the driver accessible to non-privileged users. First one scenario is when you create a device uh, with no discretionary access control list. Uh, so it's a, like direct usage of IO create device function, kernel function. Unfortunately, the IO create device function does not allow discretion access control list to be specified. And basically, your device will get the default discretion access control list, which is open for even non-privileged users. The second scenario is about creating device with a weak discretion access control list using the IO create device secure. The IO create device secure, despite the fact that it it is considered to be the more secure one if it is used with a weak discretion access control list. Of course, we are making the, driver, the, the device driver accessible for less privileged users. And the last scenario, but less significant one, is when we are using the IO create device function, uh, but uh, without a, with strong discretion access control list, but without a special flag, which is called file device secure open flag. Uh, this flag is a part of the device characteristics, which is one of the parameters to function IO create device secure. So once this special flag is not present or is not set, it means that the security settings are not applied to the device namespace. It actually means that the, dis the strong discretion access control list that was applied on the device itself is not propagated to the whole device namespace. Uh, the device namespace, you can imagine the device namespace something like a di system path to directory. And, you know, if, uh, and the device namespace is anything in the directory path, like any file, whatever. So uh, the device namespace, once we try to open something in the device namespace, it could be like non-existing file, non-existing path. Uh, it will result in opening the device itself, but the discretionary access controllers are different. 
Yeah, the device namespace will get the default discretionary, discretionary access control list, but the device uh, itself has a strong one. So, so you are still able to talk to the device driver as a non-privileged user. Uh, well, the hunting for non-privileged user accessible drivers is kind of good or can be a very interesting starting point to mass hunt for new, not known to be vulnerable drivers. Uh, you know, even, despite, even if we get some uh, accessible driver that can be accessed by non-privileged users, it doesn't literally or directly mean that the driver is vulnerable. Uh, we need to still combine the non-restricted accessibility and some capabilities that can be abused to commit privilege operations. So we put together uh, the introduced design flaws, previously introduced, and we put them into the Yara rule. And we create some general methodology we use, we use during the mass hunting. So the general methodology was that firstly, firstly we start with the initial creation of the Yara. Uh, to find new potential vulnerable drivers, those that are accessible from non-privileged users. We enrich that Yara with easy-to-abuse uh, capabilities, and we further improve the Yara and use it uh, with VT Retro Hunt service. After that, uh, we needed to post-process the detected drivers, so we filled the valid signed 64-bit drivers, a real verification of the signature, and we performed the deduplication. And the last one, you know, was uh, manually verifying via the reverse engineering that the vulnerability is real and we create some proof of concept. Uh, and other, which is also possible, reporting to vendor and some description. So firstly, we created the initial uh, Yara rule, uh, which was focused on 64-bit signed drivers and avoiding the low drivers, because we are trying to hunt for not known to be vulnerable drivers. We uh, target uh, drivers uh, with uh, either without discretionary access control list, you know, the direct usage of IO create device, or with uh, usage of week one discretionary access control list uh, with the IO create device secure. After that, we enrich the Yara with a list of easily, yeah, like easy to abuse capabilities. Uh, I mean, like kernel functions like ZW open process, ZW open thread, ZW open process token. Because once the driver is using ZW open process, there is a potential that it can return to some user mode, you know, communicating with the driver, some arbitrary process handle, which can be like super easy to abuse for local privilege escalation. And the last one, you know, we improved the Yara with the, uh, the last introduced design flaw, IO create device secure with a strong discretionary, discretionary access control list, but without the special flag file device secure open. And we use this Yara to mass hunt with the virus total retro hunt service. Uh, the Yara is shown here. Basically, we start with defining the strings of capabilities and a weak discretionary access control list. Uh, it's like, uh, it looks like super simple, but uh, we use it uh, with some uh, logic of the Yara rule. And the logic is, uh, again, we are detecting PE, 64 with Windows drivers, if the signature is present and it's kind of valid, and some logic uh, using the defined uh, strings, the capabilities and weak discretion access control list to reflect the introduced design flaws. Uh, after we detected a lot of drivers, uh, we needed to post-process them. So we used tool like SigCheck or Sign Tool uh, to filter only valid signed 64-bit drivers. And it was a real signature verification with a real uh, checking of a revocation status and other things. The deduplication was performed by a PE mass processing of PE version information and IMP hash comparison. IMP hash, I mean the imports hashing. Uh, after that, we still needed to eliminate those drivers that have a strong discretionary access list uh, defined in the configuration file. So, for example, some product which is installing the driver can use the INF file, uh, which is directly setting the discretionary access control list in the registry, and we needed to eliminate those, those that are using the strong one. Still, they can be used in bring your own vulnerable driver scenarios. And here we get basically some uh, overview. We, get, we, can, we can very quickly sort, filter, group, or whatever. Uh, and it served us to uh, get quickly some results. So regarding the hunting results, we use the Yara rule, and we also use the VT retro hunt over one year period, uh, from June 2023 to June 2024. 
The initial detection was, uh, we initially detected uh, about 22.5 thousands of drivers. Uh, after post-processing, you know, through uh, signature verification, we, get, uh, we got 4.4 thousands of drivers. And the deduplication process uh, survived almost 2,000 drivers. So uh, even though we get like 2,000 drivers, there, is, there was still the need uh, of manual verification and creation of proof of concept, which is impractical and really barely possible to perform on almost 2,000 uh, at-risk drivers. Uh, just our just initial examination of few dozen of them uh, shown some or revealed some new vulnerabilities we responsibly reported. Of course, it is not possible to share all of them here, but let's get to an example to underline our results. So, uh, one of the newly discovered vulnerable drivers was an anti-rootkit module used by Dr. Web Products. Dr. Web Products, uh, Dr. Web is a well-known security company. So we reported the vulnerability and it was patched. Uh, it got assigned a high severity 8.8 .8 score. And of course, some public disclosure was tracked under the BDU number. So yeah, we got assigned a BDU number. Uh, for those that are wondering like what the BDU is, it's like a Russian-based alternative for CVE, uh, which is very similar to CVE, but there is a difference that uh, you can actually use the BDU number to improve your LinkedIn profile. Uh, <laughs> let's get back to the exploitable dry, uh, Dr. Web products. So we found out that there are three main products from Dr. Web company. First one is Dr. Web Security Space, the other one Katana, and the other one Curit. Uh, impacts are pretty serious and interesting, uh, local privilege escalation, arbitrary read-write, kernel user mode access, so basically uh, read, whatever, uh, read, write, whatever, wherever, and uh, arbitrary process termination. The vulnerable component was 64-bit valid signed Windows kernel device driver. Unfortunately, there was no internal name, no description, so regarding the PE version information of this driver, it was like pure emptiness, still signed by Microsoft. Uh, luckily, we found that the original PDB path revealed the name of DW Shield, and we have found several versions of the of vulnerable driver. Now, something about the vulnerability description. Uh, it's using directly the iocreate device function which was already introduced that there is no way to directly specify the discretionary access control list. So everybody can access the device driver. But the, the driver itself implemented some custom protections to restrict the access. Uh, of course, we bypassed them all. Now something about the custom protections. First one was the auto-generated device name and randomly generated symlink name. The second one was digital signature check of the process main module, which, you know, the process then which try to communicate with the device driver. So regarding the bypasses, uh, the auto-generated device name and uh, randomly generated symlink name, let's forget about the device name, because auto-generated device name are Windows things, uh, and when you specify in your driver that, uh, that auto-generated device name should be created, Windows take, take care of that, and it results in like a numbered-based name, and we have a plenty of them in Windows defaultly. So we can use it, uh, but uh, luckily, Dr. Web Driver uh, introduced some uh, custom-implemented, randomly-generated symbolic name, and we can actually brute force the symbolic name uh, using uh, Windows API query dust uh, device A. Uh, because the symbolic name is always kind of rare. It's a 16 character hexadecimal string. So it's super easy to brute force it. Uh, the second uh, check was, uh, the second uh, protection was digital signature check of the process main module. Again, forget about code injection because we are now dealing with a security product and most of the code injection techniques are totally blocked. Well, so let's go back and DLL side loading keeps giving. So we actually found 
like two vulnerable components for DLSI loading and use them to bypass the digital signature check. This actually works for products Dr. Web Katana and Curate, but it's not working for the Dr. Web security space, which is like full feature, the main flag antivirus product from Dr. Web company. Uh, the components are different and basically of this product and are no longer vulnerable to DLSI loading. So let's deploy the vulnerable component, you know, rip off the Katana product uh, or, and copy those components, you know, to Dr. Web security space and abuse them. But still it's not working. We got some error message that looked like AI generated. So we were like, what is going on? Luckily, we found out kind of quickly that uh, secure, Dr. Web security space added protection, which is called module caching. And uh, it means that Dr. Web uh, components load only verified DLLs uh, signed by trusted authorities. Once these DLLs are verified, they are added to the module cache. And this module cache is a part of Dr. Web filter driver, which is called Spider G3. And this filter driver also monitors the changes to the files, which are already in the cache. And to be honest, of course, we use like super sophisticated tool to figure it out called Notepad, just to read the telemetry. If you check here is like example log that will literally tell you like, hey, this DLL was added to this cache. So, okay, we could start our IDA, you know, and, you know, show you some screenshot how we reverse it. But the truth is that we continue with reading the telemetry and we try to silo our custom DLL from custom location and it failed. And the log will literally tell you this DLL is unsigned, so I'm denying. So we tried to load the Microsoft, the original Microsoft signed DLL from our custom location. And the result was that it was added to the Spider G3 cache. So a new entry in the cache. So DLL side loading is possible. We need to only bypass the module caching. Yeah, we just play around with that and we bypass it by moving. Uh, and the result is skipping verification. So what we did, we firstly sideload the original Microsoft signed DLL from our custom location, like from desktop location, for example. And we replace this original Microsoft signed library with our own custom library, but we replace it by moving. Yeah, so we didn't copy that, we didn't create new file, we move that. And on NTFS uh, file system, it will result only in metadata changed, and this is actually not uh, uh, triggered in the file system uh, filter driver uh, used by Dr. Web. So the filter driver is kind of blind about this thing, and with that, and with chaining, all of this introduced uh, uh, vulnerability, we were able to reach the local privilege escalation even in a Dr. Web security space product. Uh, something about mitigation and remediation. Uh, there are some simple steps that need to be taken from the developer's perspective. First one is like the main, that we should not expose uh, any driver's functionality that can be uh, used to perform some privileged operation from non-privileged user. If we have such a capability in our driver, we need to restrict the access. The recommended is using IO Create Device Secure with a strong discretionary access control is, you know, to uh, uh, let allow the access only from administrator or system. Or also we can set the discretion access control is directly in registry. The last one, less significant, is of course the uh, not forgetting about the file device secure open flag. Uh, when we went over all of uh, the security products, all of the drivers, all of the drivers, uh, we found out that basically some that, are, that belong to security products are trying to uh, come out with some custom-based protection that serves as a mitigation. Here is just example what we found and how it is very simple to bypass it. For example, digital signature check, code execution, DLSI loading. If we get the like uh, first only registration, we can bypass it with race condition. And there is also very often used like encoding of IOCTL codes and transfer data, which is again super simple to bypass it just with the manual reverse engineering of the encoding logic. Yeah, and the result is that these protections are less effective than it should be. 
Uh, the other kind of critical area is what actually happens with the reported vulnerable driver. In the best scenario, the vulnerability is patched and certificate is revoked, which is actually not so often. And even if the vulnerability got patched, it is usually patched by a strong discretionary access control list, and it's still abusable, or uh, it's possible to abuse it in bring your own vulnerable driver scenarios. And the last one, you know, the Microsoft uh, Windows allows the loading of kernel drivers that are signed by revoked or expired certificates. So the truth is there is no real obstacle to prevent attackers uh, from continuing to abuse even the reported vulnerable drivers. Well, there is one promising protection, which is called Microsoft Vulner Vulnerable Driver Blocklist, but uh, the vulnerable driver must be known in advance, which means that you, can, you need to actually know that the driver is vulnerable to detect it as a vulnerable, which makes sense. Uh, and it needs to be part of the block list. This protection is available only for Windows 10 because it's uh, basically a VDAC policy, and VDAC is available from Windows 10. So, other thing is that the block list is updated uh, one to two times per year. So, the result is that attacker has at least six months window to keep abusing or even the already reported vulnerable driver. And the last thing is that the load driver database is not the same as the block list. Currently, we have like 1.8 thousand uh, drivers in a load driver database, and in the Microsoft vulnerable driver block list, there are half of them. Uh, it is sure that more com comprehensive solution uh, is needed. Uh, some of you would come out something with uh, like preventing drivers that are signed by revoke uh, certificates. But yeah, it would actually need total refactor and restructure of the Windows boot process because during the boot there is no network connection and you can actually verify the CRL. Uh, and yeah, uh, after all of what was introduced during this talk, uh, it is kind of obvious that threat actors will continue to exploit both known and yet to be discovered vulnerable drivers. So we should keep monitoring that. And with that, we actually made it to the end of this talk. So I would like to thank you for your attention and let's leave some space for questions.